Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 77th episode of the Simple, Sophisticate, and the first new episode on Mondays of 2016. I'm excited to kick off this new year because I've been, as I've had this holiday break over the last two weeks, I've been planning ahead for the next three months. And as I'm looking at my Stindig calendar here in my office, I'm looking at the phrase, the how of happiness. This whole month of January is going to dive into different topics that deal with how we can become even more content in our lives. And today's focus is on understanding what trust is, how to cultivate it, and how to trust ourselves more. We are going to be talking about that topic, but really being very specific about what it all means. It's going to be a great month. Each of the next few months will have a theme, but that is the theme of January. So I'm very excited to get down into that. Before I do, though, a few programming notes. Some of you may have already uh, tuned in yesterday. The Al Courant Weekly returned and had its first episode of 2016. Each Sunday morning, you can tune in and In fewer than 15 minutes, I will keep you up to date and in the know, as well as provide a dose of inspiration and brush up on the French language and culture in the Al Quran Weekly. So that's every Sunday morning. Be sure to tune in and stop by the blog as the show notes will be available as well. And in this week's Petit Plaisir, I am going to share with you a television series that I just came across. And after watching a handful of films and shows over the break, the holiday break, this one I think you will enjoy. I am going to recommend it highly. Um, It is a comedy, but it's also involving music. And I'm talking classical music here. But if you're not a classical music fan, do not disregard it yet. I think you'll be impressed. Um, Worth watching. Anyway, we'll talk about that at the end of the episode. So we need to get into the topic of today. The title of today's episode is called Found. The Missing Piece. So let's begin with a quote from author Charles Feltman from his book, The Thin Book of Trust. Trust is choosing to risk making something you value vulnerable to another person's actions. Meanwhile, distrust is deciding that what is important to me is not safe with this person in this situation or any situation. Now, if you have been reading Brene Brown's book, Rising Strong, that came out this last September, you recognize this quote immediately. You recognize this whole idea I'm going to talk about today, most likely. She is the inspiration for this post. Her book, her conversation is entirely the inspiration for this post. And I will explain more specifically why I decided to choose this topic in just a few minutes. Did you know that it's estimated that 50% of us made resolutions as we rang in 2016, just a few days ago? And while, as you would probably imagine, I am always on the boat of making and setting goals, whether it's January 1st or September 1st, study after study reveals that one of the many things successful, happy, contented people have in common is that they set goals clear goals, concrete goals, also known as SMART goals, the acronym standing for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Time-Bound. And while I won't be offering a concrete goal that you may select today for a resolution for the new year, I will be sharing with you a goal that I have never placed on my resolutions or goals list because I didn't know how to accomplish it until now. And that is Cultivating Trust. As much as we can blame the outside world for some of the frustrations and headaches in our lives, we also must take responsibility for how we create frustrations and headaches in our lives for ourselves. 
part of it is ignorance. The other part, though, is obdurateness or extreme stubbornness. The thinking that in no way could we be at fault and it must be something else. The beautiful realization is that often what needs to be fixed after we've changed everything on the outside that can be changed is our cognitive response. Statistically, each and every one of us has endured a loss of trust, either in our personal or professional lives. But what does losing trust look like? When we say we don't trust someone or something, what are we really saying? Whether information crosses our paths when we are looking for it or when we need it, I do not know. But I do know that Brene Brown's video for Oprah's Super Soul sessions on the anatomy of trust stopped me cold when I found it and watched it one day this past couple weeks. I had initially, to be honest, actually planned an entirely different episode for today. The first episode, after all, of 2016, I wanted to make it beat and lively and about resolutions. Well, I don't think I've entirely gone off that path. But upon watching this 24-minute video, I finally came to understand something that I had been ambiguous about since I was in high school. What is trust? How do we build trust? How do we begin to trust others? And most importantly, how do we begin to trust ourselves? I encourage you to watch the video as her eloquence and expertise will not be done justice with today's episode. But what I quickly realized as I began to reflect back on relationships and that I have been in and, and why I didn't feel comfortable with certain ones or why I, I let go at certain points or why I couldn't invest further or, or find a deeper intimacy was because at least one of the pillars of trust that Brene Brown lays out was missing. Brown shares her acronym for defining or explaining concretely what trust looks like in the word braving. So her acronym is braving, B-R-A-V-I-N-G. Let me just go through each of those very, very quickly and give you the word that it associates with. B, boundaries. R, reliability, A, accountability, V, vault, I, integrity, N, non-judgment, and G, generosity. And, and, And as she's sharing each of these pillars, I found myself nodding my head in agreement with each one. For example, I speak about boundaries and setting boundaries often here on the podcast and on the blog, but one area that is difficult for me is communicating my boundaries with others. For a handful of different reasons based on the boundary, based on the person, or based on that situation, that is hard for me. Now, it's easier in different situations, but depending on the person, depending on what I'm setting down, it's difficult. But I've also noticed that each time I do it, it becomes easier. I become clearer and I speak more confidently. I've also recognized that when others are communicating their boundaries, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this because I know then how to proceed with that relationship. Now I know where to go. Now I know where you stand. Now I know what you are comfortable with and what you aren't. And if I respect you, and if I want to build a relationship, I will respect your boundaries I will be more confident and comfortable going forward with you. They've communicated their boundaries. I've listened and I can move forward. We can move forward as we get to know each other. I think another part of the difficulty with boundaries is sometimes we don't know where they are for ourselves. We're still exploring and getting to know ourselves. And so therefore, unknowingly, we aren't sure. And so we present this idea. This person who appears to be a pushover, but isn't really. In reality, it's just we're someone who doesn't know where our boundaries are. And that takes time. Now, some things are we can be very crystal clear about, but even those may change as we get older. But there are others that will become clear with time as we become more in tune with ourselves. And we start to realize which boundaries we don't want crossed and which ones we're okay with. And when we become clear about what we know, we can be more flexible about those ones that we don't know too much about and we're still figuring out. And so it's an evolving dynamic process, but the key is communication. The trust part with boundaries begins when we communicate them clearly and determine if they are being respected and vice versa. 
if they've communicated with us their boundaries and they see us respecting what they've made clear, trust is slowly becoming built between us two. Before I explain briefly what each of the pillars are, the most important part of trust that we often forget and where our self-confidence either flows from or is unable to sprout from is whether or not we trust ourselves. Self-trust. Oh, it's huge. When we set boundaries of eliminating negative self-talk, when we set boundaries that respect our bodies, whether it's with our fitness, whether it's with our relationships, when we set boundaries when it comes to spending within our means, staying in our budget, we are respecting the boundaries. We are building trust with ourselves. And when we don't do each of those things, we are not building trust within ourselves. A lot of that for boundaries is discipline. That's self-discipline right there. So when we understand that we can do what we tell ourselves we're going to do, our confidence is built. Our self-esteem becomes stronger. And while that's a whole nother deep topic, our trust then is built and we have more confidence in ourselves to try new things, take new risks, stand up for ourselves. So many things start to be built that will benefit us. So why then? So speaking about this whole self-trust idea. So why then if, if we are someone who doesn't even trust ourselves to adhere to any of the pillars of trust, why would it be easier to trust others that we don't even know? We may want to, but do we truly? It won't be easier to trust them any more than it'd be easy to trust ourselves. Our doubt grows from having been hurt by others, but also by how we've treated ourselves. Now I'm going to take a quick one minute intermission, let all of those ideas kind of digest. And then I'm going to come back. I'm going to dive into each of the pillars of trust and give you examples for each and how they look in our lives and how we can observe them in others. So don't go away. I'll be right back. Welcome back. Now let's get in to what exactly trust is, each of those pillars. How do we cultivate trust? It all begins with trusting ourselves, as we mentioned right before the break. So let's take a look at the definition of each of those pillars. B, boundaries. We need to be clear about them and holding them and then be clear about others and respecting their boundaries. It's a two-way street. And communication is a primary ingredient. So B is boundaries. R, reliability. We trust someone to do what they say they will do. And then this act is repeated consistently over time, each time building our trust. Conversely, when we say we're going to do something, we do it. We are reliable with those that we are saying we're going to do something with or saying we're going to complete something. And each time we follow through, we build that trust. Simultaneously, we need to know our limitations and say no so that we can continue to be reliable with the commitments we make. So this is why being able to say no is so significantly important to building trust with other people. We want to say yes to everybody. Just because we say no doesn't mean we don't want to be with somebody or do something, but it's about priorities and it's about the fact that there are only 24 hours in the day and you need to get eight hours of sleep at some point and make a paycheck. So, you know, (laughs) you've got to learn how to say no so that you can show yourself to be reliable for the things you say yes for. A is accountability. When you make a mistake, there are three things. Brene Brown points out, number one, own it. Number two, apologize for it. And number three, make amends. 
And on the opposite side, when someone else makes a mistake, observe them owning it, apologizing for it, and making amends. And then let them move on. Don't hold it against them. Let them move forward as you want to be able to move forward from the mistakes when you make them. As long as you own it, apologize, and make amends. It's about being able to strive forward, dealing with what you made a mistake on, and then not making excuses so that you can move forward and not have that baggage. So A is accountability. V is vault. As soon as I saw this one and learned about it, I immediately... <laughs> This is going to date me. This is immediately the idea of Seinfeld danced around my head. And Elaine Bennis's words, it's in the vault, Jerry, it's in the vault. Um, So anyway, random little tangent there. But the vault is exactly what it is in the show. It's what I share with you will be kept in confidence. And this is the part that got me because this is vitally important to this whole concept of trust. I hold others' confidences as well and model it as to exemplify that the vault exists with others I have relationships with. In other words, you're not sharing the secrets of your best friend with your boyfriend, your husband, your parents, your other friends. If they ask for you to hold something in confidence, you do that, period. And so when others observe you. Basically, it's an observance of omission. You're not doing it. So they're seeing that you're not someone who shares others' confidences. They start to see that you are trustworthy. It's huge. Because when we, Brene Brown points out the idea of if you're trying to build a friendship or relationship on the idea that you're going to share gossip with them and negative information that's going to be hurting another relationship you have, that is not the relationship you want to build. You don't want that kind of relationship. So V is vault. I is integrity. And there are three pieces to this one. Number one, choose courage over comfort. This is a scary one. This is when you let go of settling. And when you know something is right, but you know you're going to have to make yourself a little uncomfortable to stretch outside of your comfort zone, you're willing to do it because you realize that to not do it would actually be more miserable. That's the first part. Two, choosing what is right over what is fast or easy. This one, when I heard it, made me think of the whole concept of joy versus pleasure. Pleasure is fleeting. It's temporary. And I'm not saying don't bring pleasure into your life. I'm going to have chocolate. I'm going to have those moments of, uh, of intimacy that bring great pleasure. Absolutely. But it's understanding that sometimes we have to do what's right. This is the whole discipline, self discipline. We have to look long-term rather than short-term. And it takes an adult, it takes a conscious mind, and a non-reflexive mind, meaning you're not just reacting. You're thinking about consequences, and you have that integrity to do the right thing in that moment. And the third part is to practice your values, not just profess them. So walk the talk. Walk the talk. If you say you're going to be there at a certain time, you're reliable, you're showing up at a certain time. You're not just saying yes to something, but you don't do it. You're showing up. So reliability plays a part in that part of integrity. So I is integrity. Those three pieces, choose courage over comfort. Two, choose what is right over what is fast or easy. And three, practice your values. Don't just profess them. N is non-judgment. I love this one. And I think this is part of the reason, if I reflect back, this is part of the reason I do not invest with certain friends or people that could have become friends because I observe that either I don't trust, this is the whole word again, I don't trust that, 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 that they won't devalue me in their eyes for doing what this is talking about. It's when you're able to fall apart, make a mistake, or ask for help without incurring judgment. In other words, don't place a value for needing help. If someone asks you for help, you're not looking at them going, oh, well, I can't depend on them anymore. They're, they're irresponsible. They don't know how, how to handle their money. Whatever the situation kind of reveals to you in your mind, at least you think it reveals to your mind, that is when you're going to have either people not coming to you because they're going to realize that you value needing help, or it's also maybe going to prevent you from reaching out to others and asking for help because you're afraid they're going to devalue. And some people do. We know that because this is part of 
This is why we're afraid to reach out. We've seen people devalue others because they reach out for help. We've seen it. We see it in government. Now, there is all sorts of gray areas here. If your friend consistently asks you to do something that they should be able to do for themselves, that's a whole nother issue. You've got to set your boundaries and say, wait a second, I can help you once and randomly down the road. But if you consistently are asking for money or asking for do this, I have to say no, because you have boundaries and you have to have someone who respects those boundaries. But if someone is going through a tough time, if someone, and this is just not something that happens regularly, this is where you help them and you build that trust. You're there for them. You're not a fair weathered friend and you don't, you don't apply judgment to that and vice versa. So now you are now seeking out people that you're going to be the responsible adult. You're going to live your life. Hey, things happen. You lose your keys. You you lose your your battery. Cell phone dies, and you've got to figure out another way to communicate. I don't know. I, I'm thinking things off the top of my head, but the idea is you need to be able to reach out to others that you know will not label, judge, or devalue you because you've had an oops. You've had a bad day. You needed to vent, and you just let it fly. They will not hold that over your head. It's not only acting in the way, what I mean by that is you're going to need to be able to reach out and you're going to be able to accept people reaching out to you, but it's also choosing and selecting people that are not going to abuse that. So boundaries play a role in this one as well. Help without judgment, help without judgment. That's huge. That's a huge shift for the American culture anyway, the whole idea, the whole idea of independence, the whole idea of independence. A lot of layers to that one. We could talk about that one probably in a whole nother episode. So number N is non-judgment. And the last one, G, is generosity. This one was a huge relief to my mind. Generosity is choosing not to assume the worst when someone doesn't call or forgets something or makes an error. And then you check in by communicating while you miss them or you would have liked to have heard from them. You communicate that you understand it was an honest mistake. Things happen. Life happens. They've heard you. They understand that your time is valuable. They understand whatever it is that, you know, you were confused by, like, why didn't you show up on time? Or why didn't you say you, why didn't you do what you say you're going to do? They understand that you recognize that your boundary is set. You've communicated that boundary, but you're not assuming the worst. You're not assuming, oh, you just don't love me or, oh, you just don't respect my time or, oh, you, whatever, put a negative assumption there. You're not doing that. And then you're letting them communicate with you. You're building a better relationship and you're moving forward. The key thing, no guilt, no judgment, making sure you communicate and then you move forward. This has been a huge aha for me. Simple. I know it's simple, but it's been huge. Instead of assuming that someone doesn't call or text or do something because you're not worthy or you must have done something. No, no, no. Flip automatically to the positive. Well, life got in the way. Something happened. Their kids got sick. They lost their keys. They lost, what did it, name it. And then communicate that when you have the next time you see them. And then move forward. So G is generosity. Give them, in other words, the benefit of the doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Brown's definition of trust that we just went over is the tool that has been missing from my vocabulary all of my life, and perhaps yours too. Or maybe you just needed to brush up. Perhaps you were looking for the language to better communicate what you need or what was missing from relationships that you are currently in, used to be in, or will be in in the future. In 2015, I made the move, as you know, to bend. I found the courage. I let go of some comfort. And I began again here in this town that I am so fortunate to call home. It was without question the right move for the life I wanted to lead, but there is still work to be done. And now that work is taking place within, within me. How to build trust and be more trustworthy, how to recognize why I cannot be in relationships with people I may have been in in the past, and as well, recognize why I can be in relationships with people as I move forward if I engage and exhibit trust. Instead of assuming someone new is untrustworthy, base it on what they show you. Communicate clearly 
what your boundaries are. You exhibit the values of trust and instead let go of what other people have done to you to give that relationship, that friendship, that uh, opportunity for trust to grow. Cognitively, if we've been hurt in the past, we have a reason to be guarded. It's not, we're not odd for wanting to be guarded. It's, it's human nature, but this is where the cognitive response has to be tweaked. When we give attention to that cognition and why it works that way, we can then retrain our minds and begin to behave and respond differently so that the results will be different as well. And isn't that what the opportunity of a new year is all about? Change, progress. If we begin to do and think differently, the world we create and live in will begin to respond differently as well. You have more power within you than you realize. I have more power within me than I realize. Hopefully I've cracked the book a little, shown a little light. Maybe you want to dive into the entire book, Rising Strong. I highly recommend it. I know that I am nowhere near the end of this journey that involves cultivating trust, but I do know that I'm on my way more than I've ever been in the past. And I am so excited about that. Let's make this an amazing year so that when we look back at the end in December 2016, we can say, wow, look at the trust I've built. Look at the relationships that I have the opportunity to be in because I worked on those traits of trust and observe them in choosing the people I spend my time with. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I'll provide the links that I spoke about throughout the entire episode on the show notes, the simply at luxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 77. And the video that I spoke about will also be there. I highly recommend you check it out. Now, before we leave, I've got to share you this week's Petit Plaisir. I'll be back in just a moment. This week's Petit Plaisir is an Amazon television series labeled as a comedy that takes you behind the scenes of an orchestra. It's called Mozart in the Jungle, and it actually is in its second season. I just watched both seasons (laughs) over break as I was staying in from the cold here and there and sometimes doing things, but I would often rewind an episode because I missed it and I wanted to stay on top of the characters. That's what's fun about vacation, right? Anyway, I was recently reading a review of the second season from the Washington Post. And I have to admit, I agree with her, but I still was fascinated. The first season is silly. It's fluff. It's a lot of, and by the way, I, it's an adult show. There is cussing. There is some nudity there. It's definitely for adults, but it's creative and it's thoughtful. And the second season is exceptional comparatively to the first. In fact, it earned two Golden Globe nominations for Best Television Series and Best Performance by Gail Garcia Bernal, who plays Rodrigo, the new maestro to the New York Symphony. And it is becoming a cult favorite. As the reviewer stated in the Washington Post, It was not a great first season, but viewers and reviewers on Amazon loved it. So they got a second season and it really takes you into more of a realistic idea of what it's like to travel with an orchestra and the stresses and angst of that. But then obviously it's a comedy and you've got to have relationships. And so there are all sorts of little dramas. The protagonist is a young oboist played by Lola Kirk. Her name, her character's name is Haley. So you have a lot of different levels of engagement and talent and power. And there's a labor strike going on in the second season. One of my favorite characters is played by Bernadette Peters. She is absolutely stunning in her attire and her aesthetic of her office. But her character, while fictitious in many ways with regards to her stature, um, managing the orchestra, is more developed in the second season and more playful And she becomes very strong towards the end. I won't give too much away. Let me play for you the trailer 
of the second season. I highly recommend you watch the first season so you can get the foundation for the second season. But please do not judge me after you've watched just the first season. Continue watching until the second season, and I think you'll enjoy it. If you are a lover of music, you will enjoy their certain scene. There's a fantastic scene in the first season where the maestro, the new, young, hip maestro, Rodrigo, takes his orchestra outdoors into the jungle of New York City, into this abandoned lot, cement walls surround them, and they play, and the community comes out, and it's just beautiful. It's ideal. It's obviously a bit un- impossible, but not entirely. So I highly recommend it for a good watch list television series that uh, might just be a good passing of 30 minutes. Here is the trailer of the second season. I wanted to ask you a question, and I want you to be really honest with me, okay? How does the orchestra feel about me? They think that you're crazy. Right. <laughs> and sometimes they think that they love you. Do you think that you love the orchestra? Yes, but I'm the conductor, and I must have some distance. I have to find a way of making this orchestra better. You've got to be stern, Papa. You don't want to be loved. You want to be respected. If this negotiation goes off the rails, we could seriously damage this orchestra. Hi, man. This is amazing news. That was my agent. I got it. Yeah. If I say yes to this gig, I have to leave for LA like right now. What do you mean if? You need to figure out what it is that you're doing with Alex. Okay, I'm uh, I'm not horny at all, and I really need to practice. She looks really beautiful. She does. Really beautiful. <laughs> Today I'll show you my Mexico. Look, the God of Rain. It's very similar. We have a God in my country called SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want any gossip, trust me. What does that mean? We Mexico was a fantasy that was a fantasy. It wasn't all a fantasy. No one wants a strike. No one wants to get run over by a truck, but you're about to be. The orchestra is my family. I won't let anyone or anything hurt it. This one is my baby. Tap it as softly as you can. Okay. Nothing resonates like rhinoceros foreskin. musicians and you've been there for me this is my home this is our home are you spying on us what are you talking about i'm pretty sure that you know what i'm talking about what are you talking about i'm talking about what i'm talking about i don't think you are because we never talk about what we're talking about The beauty of the ability to watch this television series is that if you are an Amazon Prime member, you get to watch all of the first season and all 10 episodes of the second season for free. And I'll provide information on how to become an Amazon Prime member if you are not already, although 25% of Americans already are, according to the New York Times, as reported yesterday in our All Current Weekly. So, Check that out on the show notes, the simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 77. That's Mozart in the Jungle, first and second season. Everything's available, streaming. You can binge, you can watch one at a time. It's completely up to you. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each Monday's podcast where I'll recommend a book, a film, a recipe, or from time to time, introduce you to an expert who offers insight into how to live simply, luxuriously, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, stop by the blog, the Simply Luxurious Life dot com or pick up the book choosing the simply luxurious life a modern woman's guide until next monday i'm your host shannon abels bonjour